Hey, what is going on there, guys? We are back for another episode of Drive to Magic. This is episode four, and I'm joined by Gregory again here. Glad to be here. And what are we talking about today? We don't even know what we're talking about. We're just gonna we're gonna wing it. That's the beauty of this thing is we always wing it. Yeah, and it always ends up being somehow decent to listen to, or I don't know, at least de- decent in my in my eyes. So where to start? Uh, the recent SEG event. SCG Cleveland. Yeah. The metagame is starting to uh, take a, a better shape. Starting to figure out what, what's going on a little bit more. So, I think first things first, uh, a couple of shout outs are in order for a few people who I know in the top eight. First off, I want to give a big shout out to Yaron Lin, also known as Yoran Lin. Yoran Lin. For being <laughs> the only mono red deck to break top eight. Um, big congratulations to him. He's a fellow student uh, who goes to the University of Pittsburgh with me. Um, and he's actually recently started judging uh, events at Top Deck Cards and Games at Bethel Park. Yeah, he's the, uh, he's the L1 that we have there. Yeah, which so. Which is pretty nice. Very excited to have him on board and um, looking forward to him judging future events at the store. Yeah. Uh, I, was, I was so glad to see him up in the Top 8. Um, had a chance to sit down and talk with him a little bit too. And he, he lost round one, but then was able to go 8-0 and o after that, primarily because he faced a slew of control decks that were too slow to handle Mono Red. Yeah. So Mono Red had a, a m- much less of a showing than it did at Star City Games' Wooster. Whoosh. So it, it seems to be starting to uh, be pushed out of the format a little bit by... Um, Mid range, I guess, mid range and slightly beefier aggro decks. Yeah, but uh, he did manage to make it there. Um, you know, with a little bit of help from Fnatic of Mogis, uh, providing some just solid straight to the face damage. And um, yeah, a big part of why he was able to crack in was just uh, control decks being too slow. So again, big shout out to him. Uh, also, want to give a shout out to Ian, Ian Barton, uh, who was playing a Naya aggro deck. Um, something a little bit more akin to what we saw from last standard three color providing a lot of different options um i used to play with ian barton uh in the niles ohio area at uh grandpa's sport cards and uh this was a lovely little shop over niles ohio where i first uh cut my chops so to speak at competitive magic where i first started playing back when i had no idea what was doing and showing up with uh essentially unplayable decks. Um, yeah, so I was really glad to see Ian Barton also make top eight and also make it to uh, third place. Um, so congratulations to both of them on making it that far. Yeah, absolutely. It's really it's really nice to see people that you know that are coming in on top eight. Uh, did uh, Yaron happen to say what he played round one? Uh, I don't remember. Yeah, that, that's what I was curious because I didn't watch. I almost never watch any of the coverage because I'm always, I'm always busy with something whenever the co- the live coverage is going on. So I never really get a chance to watch it. But you and some other people will usually fill me in via Facebook by ridiculous posts of what's going on. <laughs> so I, I usually know by uh, by midway of the event what's going on, but. Uh, I'm actually quite curious as to what he was, what he played against in round one that he lost. But I mean, playing up against control for the remainder of uh, r- the remainder of the the event before the cut is definitely an easy way to grind out and just win. Because control is great. Control is really nice in this format, and it's definitely a lot better now. But Whenever you're playing, like if you're playing three color and you're you just want to be greedier than like blue, white, or whatever color combination you want to go for, and you want to go into that third color, uh, you get somewhat significantly slowed down by playing more dual lands, more scry lands, of course, because you don't really have the option of paying the life to have them enter um, untapped. So playing up against like something like red deck, like his red deck was just really nice up against anything that's even just moderately slow. He can just grind out a win pretty easily. Yeah, Fnatic and Bogus definitely helped close out the late game whenever uh, the board was getting jammed up. Um, Burning Tramissary into a burn spell like uh, uh, Lightning Strike, rather, 
um, is is a great turn two and play, turn two play, which will get another two two out on the board, but clear out a possible blocker as well too. Um, I mean, all right, let, let's let's break down what the top eight decks were for the tournament. We had two green white aggro decks, one junk mid range deck, one Naya aggro deck, one mono green, one mono red, one black white mid range, and one black red white mid range, also known as Dega mid range. So the more you know, yeah, a lot of uh, <laughs> a lot of green, a lot of red all across the board. Noticeably absent, blue. Yep, no blue in the top no eight. No blue whatsoever. No control in the top eight. Uh, whereas two weeks ago we had control dominating the format uh, alongside mono red. Um, this week there are no control decks in the top eight, and it, it seems like the aggro decks and then the mid range decks are finding ways to have greater resiliency. Uh, up against control onslaughts. I definitely think that's true. I think after after the first week, everybody just kind of looked at it and they're like, "All right, well, what's the what's the easiest way to beat control? What's the easiest way that we just don't lose to control?" And you you have all of these mid range decks where control can do well, but they can't really do well against everything. Well, I mean, let, let's take a look at uh, the first and eighth plate decks, which were green white aggro. Now, two weeks ago on this podcast, you and I were talking about how green-white seemed like a pretty solid option, having above-the-curve monsters and a pretty solid game plan, and having, again, resiliency with cards like Advent of the Worm, which can play post-wrath, or just Rootborn Offenses, providing a populate for any tokens you have, or provide an anti-wrath tech. Uh, and then last week, we were both a little bit surprised that green-white didn't show up anywhere in yeah. the top eight. And, and now, it, now it just came in and won. And yeah, this week was its time to shine. Um, against control, what Green White can do is only play just one or two threats and ride them for the first couple of turns. Then post Wrath, they have a bunch of stuff they've been able to hold back in their hand. They can recover with a flashed in worm token. Boon Seder. Re recover with a flashed in Boon Seder. That card. Oh man, that card. That card is so good. I it mean, is really if, good. Even if you want to, if your opponent's tapped out or something, and you can go and you can bestow it. And then if they want to find a way to get rid of it, like if you bestow Boon Seder on Voice of Resurgence, yeah, you just get two creatures back now, which is just fantastic up against control, assuming that they're tapped out and you can just hit in for six damage and just get that gravy right there. But otherwise, being able to bestow is just great. It makes it great up against the, the other creature decks because you instantly buff it plus four, plus two, making your creature just a huge fat threat like on Luxodon Smiter or anything like that just having a, a huge creature like that is going to be great um, being able to flash it in up against control or up against even mid range if they just go and like uh, overload Mizium Mortars or something like that then you just flash it in post Wrath or at the end of their turn that's pretty nice as well yeah with most of the decks we saw in the top 8 this previous weekend you can hold back threats, threats in your hand until post white or until um, the control decks start to lose out some of their answers and then just ride those. It's not necessary to dump out your entire hand and try to win by going with the wide early game. Yeah. It's not as necessary. I think the big thing for me, the big reason why I didn't end up playing green white today, because we're going to standard event right now, mm -hmm. um, the big reason why I went with junk. And I, I posted this on the Facebook, which if you guys don't know that I made a Facebook page for Absolute MTG, you can find it on facebook.com slash Absolute MTG. And uh, Greg and I will talk about decks and just bullshit on there. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Like us on <laughs> Facebook and uh, join in on the fun. Yeah. So we, uh, we usually discuss decks and whatnot, but um, one of the ones that I, that I posted just before we left is um, for junk mid-range and it's it's kind of like the, the junk deck that came in um, what was it, second place? It came in second place in Cleveland however, I pretty much just went like with completely different things than um, that guy wanted to go with with junk mid-range like I think Reaper of the Wilds is probably one of the most under underrated cards that this set has 4-5 for 4 or uh, the, the biggest thing is that up against control, 
It's one of the best things that you can have whenever you have two mana open because their detention spears or anything like that just won't hit it. Mm -hmm. And if they want to go and just commit a wrath, then all you have to do is just hold back more threats and then you can resolve it during your following turn and then just put more meat onto the board because we don't have to worry about Snapcaster Mage and your opponent's going to be limited to the four wraths that they have in their deck. So they really have to be cautious about when they are actually going to use them and uh, being able to play Reaper of the Wilds, have a 4-5 or five on the board. And uh, the, the other thing that's really nice about it is the fact that whenever another creature dies, you get to scry one, which doesn't seem like it's that big. But I quickly realized after testing that deck with Reaper of the Wilds and a few other things that um, were very, like, strictly different about it, um, being able to... Even, like, if your opponent wraths you and, like, you have maybe, like, Voice of Resurgence and another creature out there, uh, getting those two scry one triggers, like, if you have a land on top, you put it on the bottom, then you do the other scry one, and being, like, it's almost like you get the scry two, but not really, but being able to scry off of, like, things dying, your opponent's creatures dying, and just gaining that advantage is huge. It's just absolutely nuts. And the fact that it can get Death Touch as well is not bad. Like, if you really need to trade it into something else, it's good for that. But if your opponent is just sitting there with um, another creature that they're going to swing into, and if they want to, like, pump it or something like that, it at least gives you a little bit more of a, uh, a rigid card that you can have up against that. Like, your opponent's going to be less likely to trade two for one just in the one creature whenever you can just give it uh, Death Touch unless they're unless that's the only threat that they're worried about on the board and they want to get rid of it. Uh, but even at that point, it's a two-for-one advantage for us, which is nice. And we still get the scry, so... Um, yeah, Re Reaper of the Wilds provides a lot of versatility in what it does in terms yeah. of making it a difficult-to-block threat, uh, difficult-to-kill threat, and the bonus of the scry as well, too, which, you know, things die. You'll be getting that scry trigger off a lot more than you might think. Yeah. Um, just in general, I think that... Uh, you know, we'll, we'll see if it, the card picks up. I definitely think it's a little bit underrated. Um, we'll, we'll see if it catches on with uh, Junkless. Yeah. Um, which which it could not. I mean, I, I play a lot of... A, a variety of different fringe cards in the decks that I play. So it, it could just be that it's one of those cards that I look at and I'm like, well, this card's really good. But other people are like, well, I'd rather run something else, which is perfectly acceptable. I think, I mean... It, thinking long term too it might be a a solid threat even you know a year from now yeah. um, that's thinking way far in the future but it could be a card to look at even uh post rotation um as well too the same way that desecration demon didn't really pick up steam until yeah. right before uh innistrad rotated out now it, it's becoming a, a very large metagame player um in general i think the junk rights deck is very well positioned uh we had a junk rights deck for fnm last friday uh, not junk rights, so junk mid range. I'm so used to saying junk rights when it comes to junk that it just it's okay. It's not wrong. They're they're playing whip. It's just not. It's more sideboard tech. No, we we had a junk mid range deck at FNM last Friday, uh, and it did very very well. Um, and it's playing like how true junk decks used to play back in the day, whenever the phrase was coined. Um, oh yeah, yeah. It's it's yeah. where junk mid range was this reverse. Uh, Golgari Rock, like Black Green Rock. You know, Black Green Rock decks, the idea is early turns, kill your threat, kill your threat, kill your threat. Drop and then fatty, drop place, fatty. And then drop a fatty, ride it on home to yeah. victory. Uh, you know, originally junk mid range decks um, were the opposite of that. It'd be play a threat, play a threat, and then kill everything on the way while you're winning with those early threats that you dropped. Yeah. And that's what this deck is going for right here. Um, you know, the junk, right, uh, junk mid-range deck that was piloted to second place uh, this previous weekend at Star City Games Cleveland was piloted by Dan Musser, uh, a mainstay, uh, if you will, of the Cuyahoga Falls, Ohio area Magic players. Uh, someone who pops up a lot at different uh, Star City Games events and, and definitely one of the better players in Ohio. Um, the deck was a little bit heavy on green. I thought that was kind of uh, an odd thing about it was uh, how heavy it was on you know Elvish Mystics and things with green costs when the layer threats were something like Obsidat or uh, you know th things like that. But um, judging by how well it did uh, this weekend and how well it did locally here at RFNM at Top Deck Cards and Games, 
Uh, I would expect to see this deck around for a while as well, too, and continue to see it being tweaked. I think the one big interesting thing about the junk decks is that none of them were running um, Archangel of Thune, which was the, the, the first thing whenever I was looking at junk and I wanted to put junk together. There's this synergy that you get whenever you're running Scavenging Ooze and you're using removal for your opponent's creatures, or even just playing things like Luxodon Smiter, where you bash into your opponent, they're going to chump walk one or two things. But then you have Archangel of Thune, you also have Whip of Erebos, which I'm still playing as a two of in the main board. And then you have like Scavenging Ooze, and you get this kind of like Junior Maliripod, not as degenerate combo that's going on where you're. Junior pod. It's junior pod. It's, Kinder pod. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's like it wants to be Malira pod, and it wants to do the degenerate things that Malira pod can do with gaining life and putting plus one, plus ones on everything, but it just can't get there. It doesn't have that de like that degenerateness of it yeah, that with, it's trying to go for. Within the limitations of standard, that's not yeah. possible. But it's it's still really good. Oh, no, it's a fantastic. I mean, it to me, I look at it, and I see it as basically... Um, the green-white aggro decks that are running around now, plus black for the, the wide variety of black removal and Obsidat. And also Blood Baron. I'm playing and Blood Baron as well. Because Blood Baron... Blood Baron's another one of those things where it's like your opponent needs far, far and away or Supreme Verdict to be able to get rid of it. And if they're wasting that stuff just like for one card worth... one card's worth of advantage, then that's pretty fine in my book. Um... But Blood Baron's awesome as well, alongside Obsidal, because he, in that deck, I, I don't want to run one over the other and just run one of them. I want to be running both. And uh, Blood Baron for pro-white and pro-black, I think, is just great. Your opponent, if they have Mizium Orders, they can get rid of it. But like for the majority of the other removal that's in the format, he's pretty good. Yeah, I mean, uh, pre-rotation, um, I never had a problem dealing with him because I was running American Control and Turn and Burn just... Smack, oh yeah, smacked him down. Smash. But now that there really isn't a deck that's utilizing blue and red very effectively, yeah, your options as to how to deal with them are a little bit more limited. Don't worry, I'll break blue, white, red. I'll play blue, white, red. Someone has to. I'll I write it out. Steam Augury. I mean, it's not the second coming of Fact or Fiction, but it's good. It needs. It's to pretty. Work. Yeah, it's really good. Um, I think that's that's probably the the premium draw that I'm gonna have in that deck. Aside aside from Sphinx's Revelation, because Sphinx's Revelation, like. That, that card's just good. I remember people talking about it. Like, looking at that card whenever it was $3, like, the, the first week after it came out, I was like, well, it's it's Blue Sun's Zenith, but it's not Blue Sun's Zenith. It also lets you gain life. It lets you fill your hand, but the, the only thing is, like, it, it has that three mana that you have to invest outside of the X, but it could still be good. And I was like, all right, well, you know what? I'll take a gamble. I'll... I'll get four, and then I was like, all right, this went up to $10. Maybe I'll get another four, and then, then it spiked up, and I was like, all right, well, this is probably a good place to be right now. Yeah, I, I remember whenever I traded a Restoration Angel for a Sphinx's Revelation back in the day, and I lost out on the trade. Yeah. <laughs> at least at that time. At that yeah, time. That. Oh, God. <laughs> Restoration Angel was such a degenerate card in the format. And yeah, it, standard the, in general. The word, of the, the word of the day is degenerate. That, that's so fine. You know. Degenerate is fine with me. Because they're... I mean, that's the best way to describe things. Maliripod, degenerate. Restoration Angel, degenerate. So, I mean, that, that's just where we're going with it. Um, yeah, I think one of the biggest things we can take from this weekend is the variety of decks that were played. And how this standard is shaping up to be, thankfully, not too degenerate yet. But also no, extremely, yeah. extremely diverse. Yeah, it's, it's definitely fun whenever you can look at two separate weeks. Granted, it's it's the beginning of the week, but two separate weeks, and you have, like, just a slew of different decks that are being played. Like, it's it's all just different, and I really like that. Um, Modern is a great format. It's really diverse, and you have a lot of different things that can be played and a lot of different things that can do well at any given point in time. Um, but... Even standard with how small the card pool is and how small like everything is ultimately, you still see a variety of different things, which is just great. If if it remains like this, where you even if it's like rock paper scissors, where like this deck beats this deck, but this deck beats that one, it's a little bit more well positioned against this, but just loses out to that. 
I think that's still fine. That's it, a fine way. That's a fine place to be. One of the coolest things of watching the coverage of the event over the weekend was how in the feature match there was never the same two decks round after round in the feature yeah. match. Each round it was a different deck versus a different deck than the the previous ones that were shown on camera, and it was really cool to see. That's it, it's definitely nice. I think this this season is definitely going to be really sweet. It's going to be a, a fun season to actually be able to play and uh, there's going to be a lot of different ways that you can approach things. Like every single week you can play something different, which is the thing that I like about Modern. That's what I, whenever we will have uh, Modern Mondays at Top Deck Cards and Games and every single week I try to play something different and since we started playing Modern I've played something different every single week and that's exactly the way that I want to approach the format and just have fun with it and if I can do that with standard now which seems to be the case I'm gonna have a lot of fun with it yeah so you're so you're playing junk yeah I'm week. playing junk yes this week I'm continuing to play uh, Mono white. white white weenie white. Um, quick update you know, I talked about this deck a couple of weeks ago um, I actually managed to take first place at FNM with the deck yeah so I mean and, and I, I've had a tendency to even sort of doubt you know my own abilities or my own deck piloting skills in the past but this deck seems to be more real than even I thought it was no oh, it's real it's the realest of Higgins absolutely um, I, yeah I was really surprised but I mean it, it definitely got there uh, I had a very uh, uh, pretty tough matchup against uh, white blue control that was splashing red uh, one of the bigger problems that came across was actually Frostburn Weird. Yeah, that, Frostburn Weird. That card hmm. just shut out all of the early uh, pressure I could put on the opponent. Uh, although Soldier of Pantheon having uh, protection for multicolored, um, you know, the card just keeps getting better in multiples. As more multicolored things keep popping in the format, I am loving Soldier of the Pantheon more and more for the work he puts in. Oh, there absolutely. are some games where if I know I'm playing a multicolored uh, opponent and I see three in my opening hand, uh, I know it's just going to be a it's just gravy. slaughter fest. It's yeah. going to be beautiful. Slaughter so, games. Oh, man. <laughs> so glad that card is not seeing play right now. No, 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 not today. It's I mean, actually seeing play. It's seeing a little yeah, bit of play. It's coming. Back. It's in Dega, but I mean, there's like whenever you're, whenever there's so many different things going on in the format, like you, you really can't pinpoint what one card you want to get rid of. Like against control, you you definitely have a smaller window of things that that you're gonna have trouble with, and if you go and name like Elspeth, that really just kind of locks them out of a pretty decent portion of uh, their, like, wind condition or being able to, like, resolve resolve it and just wrath what you're trying to do if you're playing, like... In, in the case of Dega, like, it, it doesn't... It's not going to get rid of your four power or greater creatures that you have on the board, but then you can get rid of Aetherling, which is just fine. Jace, I don't think, is as much of a threat. Like, bribery is definitely bad, like, if they use it against you and on themselves as well, but... Um, that's something that you can easily get rid of with like Dreadbore or um, Heroes, Downfall. Heroes Downfall. Yeah, I was trying to think of the name. Um, but whenever it comes to like Elspeth, like if you just get rid of it, they can't put one ones on the board. Like you can get rid of Sphinx's Revelation, but that's probably not the first thing that I would be going for. I'd much rather get rid of their threats. Uh, d depending on their hand size, that's that's probably like depending on the board state and depending what what's actually going on and what could happen in the like the remainder of the game that's basically where i would go from slaughter games but slaughter games against control is great against everything else it's probably just a little bit more subpar i think in a month or two it's you know as uh, people start to gravitate towards singular decks more often yeah it might come back yeah it definitely has the potential i mean uh, an, an, an uncounterable um memora side is definitely nice. Well, all, all this talk of Planeswalkers is getting me excited that uh, we're probably going to see a price drop in Chandra Pyromaster soon. Hopefully. Yep. So get get rid of them now. Yeah. Get rid of them now. We're uh, we're getting rid of ours, especially after this weekend. Oh yeah. Which is the Pro Tour. Yeah, that's probably well. You know what? I ex I expect to see a few of them. I expect to see like two ofs and. In mid-range decks and, and whatnot, but I don't expect to see any four of 
four of us being played in it. I'm just excited for the Pro Tour in general. Um, I'm, I'm going to be watching as much coverage as I possibly can this weekend. That's this week, weekend, isn't it? Is, it is, yes. It actually, coverage starts, I think, at some absurd time in the morning because it, it's Pro Tour Dublin. Oh, uh, yeah, that's true. So I think it's going to be like starting at like 3 a.m. Eastern time. But we should, we should probably see, um, you know, even further standard metagame development, um, some pretty awesome draft tech, uh, and, and the pros just going toe-to-toe. And I'm yeah. super excited for the first pro tour of Theros time. Unfortunately, I'm going to be out of Pittsburgh this weekend, and I'm going to be <laughs> I'm going to be busy all weekend, so I'm not going to have a chance to actually watch it. Don't worry, I'll keep you updated. Yeah, you'll keep me updated. That's yeah. fine. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. So uh, we'll see we'll see how Pro Tour goes, and we'll see how uh, tonight goes for Standard. Yeah. Yeah. So let us know what you think about the topics we talked about. And uh, in terms of YouTube, that is, this is also going to be on SoundCloud for you guys to be able to download it. But if you're listening to this on YouTube, let us know down in the comments below, of course. And until next time, guys, peace out. Take it easy.